This morning we're back in Mark's Gospel. If you would uh, like to follow along in the reading, I hope you do want to do that. Uh, we're looking at Mark chapter 10, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 12 and uh, dealing with those particular verses. <clears throat> Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. I'd like to read that for you as we begin. <coughs> and rising up, he went from there to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered around him again. According to his custom, he once more began to teach them. Some Pharisees came up to him, testing him, began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. For from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And in the house, the disciples began questioning him about this again. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now in our text we do see that Jesus is continuing his trip towards Jerusalem where we know he is to be crucified, where he will lay down his life for the sins of his people. And yet we also see that his work is not yet complete. Jesus is still seeking to shepherd his people by teaching them the truth. Now the Pharisees for their part are still trying to trip Jesus up. They're still trying to find an excuse to discredit him. They might have him arrested. They might have him killed because they hated him. Darkness hates the light. And this time their subject was divorce. Was it lawful to divorce for a man to divorce his wife? Were there grounds for divorce? And are there grounds for remarriage? Well, Jesus begins by pointing them to the scriptures. What did Moses command? They said, Moses permitted a man to give his wife a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Now, I want you to notice at this point that Jesus doesn't challenge them. It's true that Moses actually did give this command. And it's also true that this was God's word and had God's authority. But I do want you to notice that the reason why God allowed this was because their hearts were hard. This was not God's first choice. In the beginning, God made them male and female. And when a man and a woman left their father and mother, they became one flesh. They were no longer two but one. And what God has joined together, no man is to separate. Now we see the disciples weren't sure about this either, so they asked Jesus when they went back to the house about it. Jesus said, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And likewise, if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Jesus is simply saying here, no, you may not divorce for any reason. If you don't have the proper grounds, then you are committing the serious sin of adultery. I realize in today's age, people don't take this seriously at all. But we do need to, uh, to take it seriously because it is a breach of one of the Ten Commandments. Now this morning we're going to look at what the Lord says about divorce and remarriage. And because it's such a broad topic, I had to kind of speed into it. But I also want us to consider what the Lord really intends in marriage. I mean, Jesus addresses the issue of divorce and remarriage. And then he points out God's original intention, that marriage lasts a lifetime. Well, first of all, let's consider what Jesus says are the grounds for divorce and remarriage. And I think we need to begin first with what... Moses says, because this is where Jesus begins. What did Moses mean by what he wrote? And I'm going to read what he wrote in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. 
I think it's important because as I was looking at this text this week, it dawned on me that the way that most people look at it really isn't correct. This is what Moses writes, and again, what Moses gave the people of God in those days was the word of God and came with the authority of God. This is something that God gave to his people. This isn't just Moses' idea. But this is what he writes. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Now what is Moses saying here? What is the Lord's intent? Well, at least two things. First of all, he is giving something of the grounds upon which a man may send his wife away. But secondly, he is giving a prohibition here with regard to the first husband, against ever taking this woman to be his wife again if she should remarry. <coughs> Excuse me. Now on this second point, I believe what Moses is doing is this. He's warning the, the husband that if he loves his wife at all, if he has any desire of ever taking her again, he must not send her away. Because once he has done this, she is lost to him forever. If she marries another man, he may never take her to be his wife again. By the way, the question has been asked whether or not this particular prohibition is still binding, and I would say yes, it is. Because Jesus doesn't do anything in the new covenant to change this, anything that would even indicate a change. He says, before you should consider this action, if your husband or wife should ever remarry, they are lost to you forever. So that's one thing to, to bear in mind before considering divorce. But now what about the grounds upon which a man might do this? What did Moses mean by finding some indecency in her? Now again, you've probably heard that there were two different camps of interpretation. One camp believed that Moses was addressing adultery and that that was all he was addressing. The indecency that is, that, that is found here is the fact that she's been unfaithful to the marriage covenant, that she's been with another man, and that's why he puts her away. But one thing is, even though that is what Jesus is going to side with, that's not really what Moses had in mind because of what God commanded in a case like this if a woman actually did commit adultery in those days. Actually, if a man knew that his wife had committed adultery in Old Testament Israel and he had the requisite number of witnesses, she would actually be put to death. Same thing would happen, I suppose, to the man if he had committed adultery against her. Leviticus 20, verse 10. If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Now, if death was the penalty, then how could the man just write her a certificate of divorce and send her away? You know, you see, that wouldn't be an option. Now, there was another case mentioned in the Old Testament. There are cases where a man might suspect that his wife had committed adultery, but he had no proof. Well, in a case like that, we don't have time to read the whole account, but if you want to look at it, it's in Numbers 5, verses 12 through 31. There was a ceremony the man was supposed to follow that involved the priest that would expose her infidelity. And if she was, in fact, unfaithful, then the marriage would end. The woman herself actually would become deformed and that her, ab I think one of her thighs would waste away and one of her abdomen would swell, and that's the way she would remain the rest of her life. So she would remain bearing her shame with her deformity and she would no longer be married to her husband. So again, that would be the case of adultery, known or unknown, 
That's how it would conclude. It was not concluded with the putting of a certificate of divorce in her hand and sending her away. Moses, in this passage that we're looking at, did not have adultery in view because, again, the certificate would not be issued that would free the woman to be married, another, to, be married to another man if she had committed adultery. Now, certainly, if that were the case with regard to adultery, it couldn't be referring to other more perverse kinds of sexual immorality or indecency, such as if the woman had committed sodomy or some other sin, because those two were punishable by death. So again, what I'm saying is that that first camp of thinking is not really what Moses had in mind. Now, the other view was that Moses was saying that a man could divorce his wife for any reason at all. If he found some indecency in her, something that he could not live with, that he would give her a certificate of divorce and send her away. Now, I think that this is likely the view that is correct. Now, the Lord, you need to realize, gave this command not because it was his first choice. I mean, Jesus tells us what God's first choice is, that the man and the woman remain married. But he gave this command because of the hardness of his people's heart. And what he was saying is this, that if a man refused to love his wife because there was something about her he just could not tolerate, that he might send her away and that she might enter into another covenant of marriage, but that he might not take her again. Now, this permission on the part of God was not an endorsement of divorce on these grounds, but it was an indictment against the man who divorced his wife. Now, certainly the Lord allowed it, but he never really approved of it, as we see where our Lord Jesus tells us what God's will actually is. I think the point is that God was not willing to condemn the woman to a life of no love if the husband was intent on not fulfilling his part of the marriage covenant by loving his wife. Now, I want you to notice in our passage that Jesus doesn't challenge their understanding of this commandment by Moses. What did Moses command you? And they told him what Moses commanded, and he says it's because of the hardness of your heart that Moses gave this. He doesn't challenge what Moses said. He doesn't even challenge their interpretation of it. He knows why God gave it, and he knows it was because of the hardness of their hearts. It was not because of righteousness, but because of sin that he gave that particular commandment. But he does go on to tell us what's most important, and that is what God's will actually is. God intended that marriage, first of all, be between one man and one woman. He made them male and female. Now, if you've ever been to a Ken Ham conference, and he talks about uh, Genesis and the beginnings of all things, he, you probably heard him say something like this. He made them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Okay, it's between one man and one woman. That is God's declared and express will. And that alone is what constitutes marriage. So let me just say as an aside that even if we have states or even if we have a federal government that one day allows homosexual marriage, it is still not a marriage in the sight of God. This is the only thing that God will recognize. The others are in fact an abomination. Now, he made man, as we saw earlier, and seeing that it wasn't good for the man to be alone, he made a woman. He made a creature that corresponded to man's needs, one that would complement him, one with which he could, in fact, produce children and fulfill the mandate to fill the earth. And once they were married, they were no longer to see themselves as two, but rather as one, one flesh, one body, and they were to love each other as they loved themselves, as they loved their own bodies, because as a matter of fact, they were one. What the Lord had joined, no one was to separate. So what is the Lord saying here? He's saying that marriage is meant to be for life. If a man divorces his wife or if a woman divorces her husband and either marries another, they have committed adultery. And so the answer to the question, can a person lawfully divorce their spouse for any cause at all? The answer is no. No, he can't. But now that's not the end of the story. There's quite a bit more to it than that. 
Jesus doesn't speak of it here, but he does give grounds on other occasions for the disillusionment of a marriage. We've got to remember that this isn't the only thing that Jesus said about divorce and remarriage. Now, one of the grounds for having a lawful divorce and remarriage is adultery. In a parallel passage in Matthew, he says in the same context, in Matthew 19, verse 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Now, what is Jesus saying here? If a man divorces his wife for any reason short of infidelity, then if he remarried, he would be guilty of adultery. If she had committed adultery in this marriage, then if the man divorced her and remarried, he would not be guilty of adultery because her adultery had already broken the marriage covenant. You see, if there's no adultery before the divorce, then there's no breaking of the covenant. So that if a man puts his wife away without the adultery, then he's committing adultery when he remarries because he's still bound to his wife. And there's a covenant that still exists. And he would break that covenant in the act of marrying that other person. But if the marriage, again, is broken prior to that, then there is no divorce when the remarriage takes place. Now, I'll come back to that in just a moment. But Jesus gave one other ground for divorce and remarriage. And that is through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, where he talks about the ground of desertion. And again, Jesus not personally giving this, but he's doing it through his spirit, through the Apostle Paul. He writes 1 Corinthians 7, verses 12 through 13 and verse 15. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Now, what he's saying here is this. By the way, I should mention when he says, this is what I say and not the Lord, he's not saying that this is my personal opinion. Jesus doesn't have anything to do with this. But what he's saying is, I'm saying this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not say this in what is written of what he said, but this is what God's will is. This is still binding. What Paul wrote, even as Peter recognized the writings of Paul, to be scripture is binding on us. He says the fact that an unbeliever deserts the marriage covenant, that that breaks the covenant as well. Remember what the covenant is. It's a covenant of companionship. Adultery breaks that covenant of companionship. Desertion, how can you be a companion if you're nowhere around? Breaks it too, right? So that the brother or the sister is no longer under bondage, which means they're no longer bound to that marriage covenant. And being loose now from their previous spouse, the believer may remarry without sinning. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 27 through 28. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife, but if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But the marriage should only take place in the Lord. Now, what about the unbeliever who departs? If he remarries, is he committing adultery or she? Well, obviously not, because they're no longer bound in that marriage covenant. There's no longer a covenant with that other person to break, so they're not committing adultery. Actually, though they are still guilty of desertion, of having broken their original marriage covenant until they repent and believe. And when they do, they are forgiven of that guilt. So now they stand as one who is completely cleansed in the eyes of the Lord, no longer bound, but free to marry again. Now the same thing would be true of the one who committed adultery in the first example. Remember the man may not divorce his wife unless it's for immorality, unless it's for adultery. 
If he does on those grounds, he may divorce her and remarry. But what about the woman who was divorced? The woman who committed the adultery? If she marries again, is she going to commit adultery? Well, obviously not, because she's no longer bound to that, under, that other individual. However, she still bears the guilt of her adultery until she repents and believes, at which time all of her guilt is removed, and she becomes pure and holy in Christ. And then, of course, she may remarry, or he may remarry, depending upon the case may be. Let's not forget that there is forgiveness, there is mercy, Every sin that man commits, every blasphemy against the Son and the Father will be forgiven men. There's only one sin that can't be forgiven or that won't be forgiven, and that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that's altogether different. So there is forgiveness for this, and a person may move on. Now, I should mention one other thing in this regard, and I think we probably have a fuller picture. If a believer leaves another believer, you know, Paul says that if... If two know the Lord and one departs, that they should remain unmarried or else be reconciled. They should be, remain unmarried so that they can be reconciled. I don't think Paul is saying it's okay to remain separate, but you need to reconcile. Okay? But what if the one who leaves refuses to reconcile? Well, then that would constitute grounds for a divorce because by refusing to reconcile, this professing believer is actually deserting the covenant and he's breaking. He's, the, he's really like the unbeliever departing. And the fact that he refuses to repent of that sin of leaving his wife and be reconciled means that he's really to be declared not a Christian. If there's a sin that you continually commit and you refuse to repent of it, it just shows that you're not a Christian because no Christian can practice unrighteousness. So the church would declare the, the person who said he was a Christian who departed to be a non-Christian and the believer would then, of course, sue for a divorce. Now, again, can you divorce for any reason at all? Can you just say, I don't like you anymore, and give a person a certificate of divorce and send them away? Of course not. But if the covenant is broken by your spouse, either by committing adultery or by deserting the covenant through abandonment, then you may sue for a divorce and being divorced, you may remarry without sinning against the Lord. Yes, there are biblical grounds for divorce and remarriage. Let me just come back around to one other idea, though. We should also note that if a husband or a wife breaks the covenant, either by way of adultery or desertion, that doesn't mean the marriage has to end. It can still be restored. If there's repentance on the part of the sinning spouse, there should be forgiveness on the part of the innocent spouse. Remember, the, we're going to get to this in just a minute, but um, a lack of love is the reason why these things are happening in the first place. And we don't want to find ourselves guilty of an unwillingness to forgive sins that are committed against us. But on the other hand, if the guilty party who committed the adultery or deserted does not repent, or let's say that they repent but they repeatedly do it again and again, recommit the sin again and again, repenting again, committing the sin again, there does come a point where you have to say, this person really isn't repentant. And the righteous thing to do is to put the unfaithful spouse away. And I say that only because there are some who believe that no matter what your spouse does, if they abandon you for 50 years, or if they continually commit adultery and then keep coming back to you, that you are bound to keep forgiving them and you have to stay in that kind of relationship. I don't believe that that's what the Lord intends. It is a covenant of companionship. It's supposed to be for the mutual benefit of both, not to continually injure the other person. No, the Lord does, in fact, allow us to do so. And it's because of God's grace and mercy. As a matter of fact, uh, most people don't, don't understand this, but God himself divorced. He divorced Israel. That was his bride. That was his body. Those were his people. And when they rejected his son, he put them away. And he took to himself a new bride. And that bride is the church. So God put away an unfaithful spouse. We may as well, if they are in fact unrepentant. Now that brings us to the second point. This one's going to be a bit shorter. <coughs> 
What does God really intend in marriage? I mean, that's, that's what's behind all of this. It's not to regulate when and when not can I get rid of my spouse, but what is the Lord actually saying here? You know, sometimes Christians are consumed with trying to figure out if they can divorce when they should instead be remembering the Lord's command to love their spouse. Now, yes, there are grounds upon which you might be freed from an unfaithful spouse. The Lord is gracious. He doesn't expect you to live your entire life with an infidel or one who has abandoned you. I, again, I just remember the example I wanted to give. There was a woman who, uh, whose husband abandoned her after a couple of years of marriage, and she remained unmarried her whole life, praying for him. And he finally came back when they were in their 80s. He finally came back. He lived for about less than a year and he died. Was that God's will? Well, maybe in that case, he put it on her heart to wait. I don't know. But was she bound to wait for 60 years for him to come back? No, she wasn't actually. God doesn't expect you to live your whole life alone because you have an unfaithful spouse. But on the other hand, he doesn't want you to seek to be freed from your spouse for any reason at all. He wants you to love them. Remember, God made the woman for the sake of the man and brought her to the man. They became one flesh. And what God has joined together, no one is to separate. When you enter into the marriage covenant, you're promising to love and to cherish each other. How long? As long as it's convenient? As long as you feel like it? No, as long as you both shall live and the Lord wants you to keep that promise and that covenant. He doesn't want you even to allow yourself the, the uh, as it were, the luxury, although that's a bad term to use, of growing tired of each other. That's not an option. He doesn't want you to find fault looking for a reason to divorce. He doesn't want you to allow your relationship to reach critical mass with regard to your love and patience so that you begin to look for a way out or begin to look for somebody that you might think you're going to be happier with. He wants you instead to lay down your life here, as in all other areas, to be faithful to him in keeping your vows in what you promised you would do. He wants you to be faithful. Well, how can you be faithful to the Lord in this area? Well, you can only do it in the way that you can be faithful in any other area, and that is by the grace that God supplies. Apart from the grace of God, you can't do that. Even though there are unbelievers, apart from the grace of God, at least the saving grace of God, who seem to make it their whole lives. There was a couple I heard of where they met. Two days later, the man asked the woman to marry him. They got married, I think, a week later, and they were married for 75 years. How do they do that? Well, God's common grace, for sure. They also lived in another generation. They didn't live in this adulterous generation. So they reached 75 several years ago, or 75 years, and, and they're gone now. They were from a previous generation. But maybe they had a lot in common. You know, I mean, that, that can happen too. They just liked each other. They loved each other, and they, they did that. But how do you do it when you don't have such an ideal relationship where you get along so well? You can only do it by the grace of God. By the way, it does have to start, I think, even further back than once you're into the middle of the marriage covenant. I, I think those of you who are young and still are unmarried, there are certain things you can think about that will help you find the right choice for you. First of all, you need to be the kind of person that is worth marrying if you want a marriage to last. You need to seek to grow up and mature in the Lord, to be filled with the Spirit of God to be directed by the Spirit, and to walk in the ways of the Lord. You see, if you're not the kind of person that can enter into this marriage covenant for life, well, then that marriage covenant isn't going to last until you become that kind of person. It's better to become that kind of person before you go in than it is once you are in it. So if that's not what you're doing, make sure you do that first. Make sure as you're thinking about marriage someday that you are the kind of person that can make it to the end because you are trusting in the Lord and you are filled with the Spirit and you are grown up in Him. Otherwise, again, you may not make it. 
And then secondly, you need to seek for a spouse that is seeking to do exactly the same thing. Seeking to grow in Christ, seeking to be mature. You know, if, if you are a believer and you don't have the gift of contentedness to serve the Lord without being married, I do believe God will provide someone like this if you are like what you need to be. If you're not like that, don't seek a spouse. If God is faithful, he won't allow you to find one until you are ready. Paul writes in Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. God will provide. If you are seeking him and seeking to grow in him, he knows your needs and he will give you that person in his time. So you be the right kind of person and then look for the right kind of person. The right kind of person is not the one that's all glowy outside, you know, the one that's so pretty that I have to look at them all the time. That may not be the right person, you know. You need the person who is right on the inside. But, of course, you still need to, to like the way they look on the outside. It's not the, you know, you can just marry somebody you think is, is ugly. You can't, you can't do that. It's not going to work. But beauty is not the main thing. It, outward beauty, inward beauty is. That's the one you should be seeking after. Now third, provided that the person, that person loves you as much as you love them and is free to enter into that marriage covenant, they're not bound to somebody else, when you marry, you need to marry with the understanding that you are committing yourself to love that person for the rest of your life. For the Lord's sake, even if you can't do it for your own sake, even if you can't do it for your spouse's sake, you must do it for the Lord's sake. Now, if you really love the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what you will do. You will do it this way. Because if you think you love the Lord and you're not doing this, then you really are not loving the Lord. You see, you really can't love the Lord and not love your spouse if you made the promise to do that because Jesus says that he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the Lord tells you, keep your vows. So if you really love the Lord, this is what you will do. You will do it for his sake, even if you can't do it for your own, because it is good for you that you're faithful to that covenant, and even if you can't do it for your spouse's sake, because you've reached a point where you don't feel that love anymore. If you love the Lord at all, you will still do it for his sake. But let me mention this as well. That having made that commitment to love that spouse for the rest of your life, you must do everything you can to preserve that covenant and to be faithful to that covenant and to make sure that you are keeping God's love in your heart burning brightly so that you can share that love with your spouse and try to help her to have his love in her heart burning brightly as well. You see, if you both have the love of the Lord strongly in your hearts, then you will love each other. If you don't, you won't. If you think you have God's love in your heart burning brightly, but you don't love your spouse, guess what? You don't have God's love burning brightly in your heart. Otherwise, you would love your spouse because that's what that love does. Sometimes we mistake emotional feelings of warmth and so forth for God's love, but if it isn't actually producing the kind of fruit that the Bible says it will produce, which is faithfulness to the Lord, then it's not really love for God that you feel. Maybe you're just feeling love for yourself, you know, that might be what it is. Because you will love your spouse if you love the Lord. I like the way Henry Smith summarized this, and I, I put it on the back of your bulletins. Speaking to the man, he says this, and this is, this is perhaps uh, something to memorize, for those of you who aren't married, but then for those of you who are as well. He says, first he must choose his love, and then he must love his choice. I think that's a wise counsel. Choose your spouse wisely because nothing that you can possibly do in your life could make you more miserable than a poor choice in this area, right? Make a good choice. And then once you've made it, set your heart on loving the one that you choose with the love that God supplies. That's really what's behind everything that the Lord is, is saying in our text here. It's not really the question of divorce, what are the grounds out of it, although sometimes it can boil down to that, but it should be, what is my responsibility in this covenant? What does God want me to do? That is what 
we need to be thinking about. And that he wants us to do, choose wisely, and then love that person the rest of your life as you love your own flesh. So may the Lord grant us his grace to be able to honor him at whatever you know, particular stage we are in this whole process, wherever we happen to be right now, whether we're single or married. But may he especially give to those of us who are married the grace to love our spouse, even as the Lord loves his own bride, to love with the love of Jesus Christ. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord simply to apply what we've heard uh, to us, to ourselves as individuals and be prepared if the Lord shows you areas where you need to repent, be prepared to repent and ask for grace to do what he, again, calls us to do from this passage.